Hello, everyone. This is Corbin Curtis broadcasting to you from the Point of Care Testing Center for Teaching and Research at the University of California, Davis. Today, I will be describing innovations in point of care testing that could enhance United States disaster caches. To give you a little background, our team here in Davis was given the opportunity to inspect one of three of our nation's major disaster caches. We evaluated the cache to look for deficiencies in point of care testing that we can improve with recommended new technologies, which you will see at the end of this talk. This lecture corresponds to a manuscript recently submitted to the American Journal of Disaster Medicine, which we will add a link to on our YouTube site once the paper is published. The objectives of this lecture are to describe the current state of point of care testing in our nation's disaster caches. Also, we will show commercially available products to protect point of care devices from austere environmental conditions. On a side note, we do have a YouTube lecture that is already dedicated to environmental stress testing, which uh, I will refer you to in a couple of slides. If you haven't seen this lecture, though, I highly recommend you do after watching this one because it will give you some background for slides four and five in this lecture that summarizes how environmental stresses affect point of care. And back to bullet three. We will show new point of care recommendations that could be better suited for caches with a special focus on cardiac troponin eye testing. And lastly, we will introduce a framework for implementing new point of care technology into disaster caches. What are shown here in frames A and B are the current point-of-care devices included in the nation's disaster caches. In frame A is the Lab Basic, which is the standard package and is sent to all disasters. These packages are deployed with disaster medical assistance teams. Starting from the upper left and going counterclockwise in frame A, you see the iStat with the Chem 8 Plus cartridges to test for electrolytes and the G3 Plus cartridges to test for blood gases. Below that are pregnancy test strips that test for human chorionic gonadotropin. To the right of those, you see the Clinitech Microalbumin 9 reagent urinalysis strips for kidney disease testing. To the right of that, you see the One Touch Ultra, which is a glucose meter to monitor sugar levels in diabetic patients. Lastly, in the upper right of frame A, is a cardiac biomarker device. This measures cardiac troponin I, myoglobin, and CKMB to determine if a patient has a myocardial infarction. We will be discussing the accuracy of this device later. Now, let's look at frame B, or Lab Plus. This package is only sent to disaster sites that require more testing than the Lab Basic can provide. In the upper left, you see a fecal occult blood test to detect lower GI tract bleeding. Below that is a heavy hematology analyzer that contributes significantly to the 400 pound pallet sized package that is the Lab Plus. To the right of that, there is a urine dipstick analyzer to go with the strips that were in the Lab Basic. You can tell, however, by being in separate packages, it is not necessary to use the analyzer with the strips because they can be manually determined. Above that, you see the PTINR cartridge for the iStat to monitor patients on anticoagulants. And on the right of there is the Piccolo Express with a chemistry panel to test liver function as well as a triage drugs of abuse test and rapid tests for strep throat, mononucleosis, and D-dimer. The devices in the Lab Basic and Plus are susceptible to errors when tested in areas lacking portable air conditioning or heating. Normally, when deployed to disasters in the U.S., these devices are operated in an environmentally controlled tent or truck. However, if resources are limited in certain settings, they may lose the ability to control conditions. Therefore, responders should be aware of the issues that point of care can have without protection from the environment. For the full background on environmental stresses, please refer to our other YouTube lecture by Dr. Richard Louis titled, Environmental Stress Testing, Clinical Needs and Impact Analysis. If you've already seen it, then this will be a little review. In summary, austere conditions are experienced in most disasters. As you can see, temperatures reached 43.3 degrees Celsius, which is almost 110 degrees Fahrenheit during Hurricane Katrina. 
And in the 2011 Japan earthquake, temperatures reached below freezing at negative 5 degrees Celsius or 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Point of care technologies have manufacturer specified operating temperatures for a reason. They are not meant to be operated in these extreme temperatures and can give false results when operated in these conditions. Here are some commercially available products that could protect point of care in these extreme conditions. The x-axis shows the weight of the devices, so as you move from left to right, the devices become progressively heavier. The y-axes show temperature ranges that correspond with the dotted and solid lines under each device. The dotted lines show the temperature range that each device can hold internally. The solid lines show the temperature range that each device can handle from the outside environment while still keeping the internal temperature within the corresponding dotted line. As an example, let's look at R11, or the device third from the right. This device has only been tested at a constant outside temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, during which the container was able to hold 2 to 8 degrees Celsius internally for an extended period. If you would like more explanation of this figure, please comment below and we will try to help. By the way, that goes for anything else in this lecture, so please feel free to ask questions. Now we will be focusing on cardiac troponin I devices for the next three slides because of their important role in detecting myocardial infarction and other acute coronary syndromes in patients with chest pain during disasters. This first slide shows currently available point of care and near patient testing devices that are potential candidates to replace the LifeSign MI, which is the device in the lab basic, shown on this slide from earlier. Going back to slide 6, you can see that the top row devices are handheld, the second row devices are portable, and the bottom two rows are transportable, and that means they have to be moved using a cart. Just to let you know, the Cobos H232 in the upper right is not available in the United States. This makes this device ineligible to replace the LifeSign MI. However, we just wanted to show it because it is widely used in Asia and South America. You can see on this slide the limit of detection of the LifeSign MI is at the bottom of the list when compared to some of the other devices that we just saw on the previous slide. This shows that the LifeSign is lower quality in terms of concentration of troponin that it can detect in a whole blood sample. Something not shown in this slide is a typical concentration of troponin I that indicates a myocardial infarction. If you search current literature, Myocardial infarctions have been diagnosed in patients with a troponin I level of 10 nanograms per liter. So when using the life sign, what do you think happens to the patients with levels between 10 and 1500 nanograms per liter? If you thought they get sent home, you would be correct. Many of these patients could die in their homes as a result of this misdiagnosis. So this slide shows how point of care devices match up with a normal population curve for troponin I levels. There are three criteria for troponin I testing that devices must meet if they are to be considered a quality test. One is that the device should be able to detect a rise of troponin I over time. So right off the bat, you can see the life sign is qualitative and doesn't meet that criteria. The second is that the coefficient of variation, or CV, must be 10% or less at or below the 99th percentile. Again, the life sign does not pass the test. The third criteria is the device must have a low enough limit of detection, or LOD, to detect at least 50% of the normal population. Now, this is a difficult standard to meet for any point of care device, but the life sign is by far the furthest away from meeting it. For those unfamiliar, the 99th percentile is the point on the curve where only 1% of the population remains to the right of that point. This means any patient with a troponin I level above the 99th percentile is a patient that potentially has a myocardial infarction. As you can see, the 99th percentile of the normal population sits at 14.4 nanograms per liter. Only the path fast comes close to meeting all three criteria. The PathFast is even more accurate than some laboratory devices used in hospitals. Unfortunately, you will notice in the next slide that we did not choose the PathFast to be part of our new recommended disaster cache. This is due to its weight 
and the fact that a handheld point-of-care device is better suited for a disaster response team. And the only handheld device that comes close to an acceptable accuracy is the ISTAT, which you can see on this slide is relatively close to the normal population's 99th percentile. As a result, we chose the ISTAT as the Draponin Eye testing device for our new recommended disaster point-of-care cache shown on this slide. We do recommend that when more accurate handheld devices for cardiac troponin eye become available, they should be evaluated as a replacement for the troponin eye testing. If you take a look at the upper left, you'll notice we also chose to upgrade to the new wireless iStat to begin integrating connectivity concepts into disaster caches. Connectivity will accelerate patient data transfer and improve patient tracking once all devices have wireless or Bluetooth capability. If you keep looking at the iStat, we kept the cartridges that were in the lab basic because electrolytes and blood gases are some of the most common tests performed on disaster victims. To the right of that, you will see the new FDA approved Aura Quick Advance for HIV testing. The caches already had the Clearview HIV 1 and 2 stat pack test in their pharmacy caches, which also are brought to disaster sites. However, we feel it makes more sense to include HIV testing in the disaster point of care cache to be readily accessible by responders since it will be used to test patients after a responder has an inadvertent needle stick. And actually, this is another reason we chose the OraQuick as an alternative because it can use oral fluid which will eliminate the chance of more needle sticks. To the right of that, is a Bluetooth-enabled pulse oximeter, which is vital for monitoring critical patients. Next is a pregnancy test, which is a different manufacturer, but the same test was included in the lab basic. In the top right is an in-development hematology test that we recommend incorporating when it becomes available, as it will reduce weight and complexity compared to what was originally in the lab plus. Below that, we recommend keeping the hemocult and the rapid test for strep throat mono and D-dimer. On the left of that is a new device for coagulation monitoring. The CoagulCheck is widely used and proven in accuracy, and we recommend it be used instead of the iStat PTINR cartridge that was in the Lab Plus. Next on the left, we recommend influenza testing be added to the caches. This is important to keep track and prevent the spread of epidemic cases of the flu. We recommend keeping the Clinitech urinalysis strips on the left for kidney disease testing. And then if you look to the right and slightly down from the Clinitech, we recommend a blood typing card because even though caches are sent with a blood bank supply of O negative, we feel there is a chance for supplies to run out without ability to get a resupply, in which case emergency donations may be needed. We also kept the triage drugs of abuse test card, but upgraded the glucose meter to the stat strip, which corrects for hematocrit, and adds lactate, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and creatinine. On the bottom right, we also recommend adding the co-oximetry Mossimo Rad 57, which repositions co-oximetry to the DMAT caches as well as reduce weight by replacing the currently used LifePak 12 and or 15. Last but not least, on the bottom left, we added a patient health security card to keep track of patient results and movement throughout a response. The MinMax temperature thermometer on the bottom left is recommended to know when devices and reagents in the box have exceeded their manufacturer specifications and should not be used. In addition to the disaster point of care cache, we recommend a customizable package be incorporated into DMAT caches. This package can be compartmentalized for different types of situations. For instance, a compartment could have infectious disease testing for MRSA and influenza, while another compartment could be used for biothreat detection devices for threats like anthrax and tularemia. Now, how do we properly implement all of these new devices, you ask? Well, here is a flowchart that provides a roadmap for implementing new point-of-care technologies into disaster caches. 
starting with national and global leadership on the left, point-of-care experts in the form of an external advisory board can assist with forming a strategic plan for point-of-care testing and implementation timeline, as well as figure out policy and funding. Needs assessment should be incorporated into the process by surveying users to guide point-of-care developers, select the right devices and tests, develop hospital requirements, and design disaster caches. All of this will feed into standard operating procedures that describes clinical use of -of point-of-care tests, has step-by-step procedures, as well as shows limitations, reagent storage, requirements, and specimen handling instructions for the point-of-care. These procedures can be used to validate the chosen point-of-care tests, whether they are CLIA-waived, where validation only requires following manufacturer instructions, or for non-waived tests, where accuracy and precision studies, correlation studies, linearity verification, and Mad Max AD analysis must be performed to validate the test. The validated tests can then be harmonized with the strategic plan formed by global leaders, and the standard operating procedures can be finalized. The next step is to write a competency plan that includes test principles, operating manuals, results interpretations, and confounding factor and interference information for the various tests. Operators should then be trained using the specified requirements for either CLIA-waived or non-waived tests, and thereafter should have yearly competency assessments with documentation of the retraining. An online system of education should also be created using the same training instructions that operators are given. This web-based system can be used for just-in-time instructions for responders out in the field, as well as a tracker of cache resources and operator locations for a point-of-care coordinator. Operator training and just-in-time resources will lend to field use of of point-of-care with competent operators that know to check the min-max temperature thermometers, making sure storage conditions stayed within manufacturer specifications. These competent operators will also know to perform quality control before testing and maintain a suitable environment for the point of care. After all pre-patient checks are done, they can begin victim testing, enabling ancillary care facility. We would like to conclude with this lecture that innovations in point of care technologies can improve response preparedness with enhanced diagnostic capabilities. There are several innovations, such as the iStat Wireless, MicroCBC, and AuraQuick Advance HIV 1 and 2, that will improve test clusters to facilitate evidence-based decision-making and improve crisis standards of care during U.S. national disaster responses. And lastly, strategies, point-of-care resources, and operator training should be harmonized globally to improve efficiency of international responses. We'd like to remind everybody to keep a lookout for the paper that was submitted to the American Journal of Disaster Medicine on June 13, 2013. Thank you for taking the time to listen, and have a good day.